Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Fresh off, yes. Hi, everyone. Candace alcoholic. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be here with you for these past few days and to be of service tonight. Welcome to our new friends. Welcome to everyone who identified uh, as being under a year sober. How exciting. How exciting that first year. There's just nothing like the first year sober. It's all new. You've never done it before. Is it really going to work? Are they lying to me? People have lied to me. You know what I mean? So much is going on. And uh, at the end of the day, the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous is it doesn't really matter how you feel about it. This is not that type of program. And if they haven't told you, I have to do that now. (laughs) It doesn't matter. It matters what you do. Alcoholism doesn't want us to be here. It doesn't want us to be in Puerto Vallarta. It may want us to be in an alley, lying and deceiving someone, but it doesn't want us to be here in the Mecca of beauty. And the Mecca of beauty is wherever we come together, celebrating sobriety, celebrating a new life. What it takes to walk through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, let alone get on a plane and come here and another variant. You know what I mean? Like, that's just crazy. It's a lot. And so especially our friends in their first year, You know, I celebrate you. I am so excited for you. My responsibility here tonight is to share with you, right, my journey, what it took for me to get here, what it takes for me to stay here. And I'm going to give you the first word is surrender. I have to be willing to surrender everything I think I know about everything. Everything. My ego doesn't want me to stay sober. My ego wants me to look good, but it's fear driven. So I'm going to have to be willing to look bad at some point to feel good. So you've heard everyone get up here and say thank you to the committee. I want to, I want to really break that down a little bit. The reason when we talk about the committee, we talk about the volunteers. Sobriety is about being divinely inconvenienced. (laughs) That's what it is. This is not about because while we get to, to sit here and I'm going to come up here, I'm going to do what I need to do, I'm going to sit down, but I guarantee you tomorrow night, I mean tomorrow morning, my friend Russ is talking, right? Last night, Mike spoke, Barbara spoke earlier. The reason we get to come in and do what it is we do because of all the people behind the scenes that keep everything running so we don't have to worry about anything, right? I came fresh off the streets. And so I remember coming into, I went into a rehab, which is not AA, but that rehab was a safe place, <clears throat> pardon me, where I didn't have to think about anything. That's what they're doing. So they're not always able to, to make all of the, the meetings and the workshops. There were a few people, my friend Jason, right, who couldn't be there because he was at the registration desk and just being all around fabulous, right? <laughs> And so they do that so that we can come in and do what we need to do, which is to heal, which is to recover. That's the purpose of a convention, so that we can come in and get spiritually recharged. And so when we thank the committee and we thank all the volunteers right now, we are thanking them from the deepest space of appreciation. So we really want to thank you so very much. You know, you heard them talk about people dropping out, people who are supposed to be here aren't here, there's fear going on, and still they rally forth, and when you talk to them, they're polite. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because when I'm stressed, I'm not always polite, right? I don't know, tell your sponsor about it, Kansas is rude. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my sobriety date is August 16th, 1995, that's the only date I've ever had. And that is because, thank you. And that is because literally I have had to surrender behaviors and belief systems that would not allow me to stay here continuously. That's a big deal. I don't do anything continuously. That's like, that's not my MO. And so I remember I was talking to a few new friends at banquet and what an amazing banquet. And did you see how the band was singing to me? (laughs) I'm the only one on the mic. You can't refute it. So there it is, right? So... So we were talking at dinner, 
and talking about when we got sober, you know, you get sober, again, not really think I'm going to stay sober, not even knowing I'm really buying into like all of it, right? And so they told me when I got sober to give this, this program 365 days. They said, stay sober, do everything we do. It's conditional. Stay sober, do everything we do for 365 days, one year. And if in a year your life has not significantly improved, we will gladly refund your misery. I caught that. You didn't say happiness. You were, uh, right? And so I remember saying, I'm going to do everything they ask me to do. 26 years later, I do everything they ask me to do. I don't have to like it. I don't know what's happening right now in Alcoholics Anonymous that we think we have to like everything all the time. That's ridiculous. In order for me to grow, I have to be spiritually reconfigured, right? Because I come in, I am filled with fear. I am filled with shame. I am so broken. I don't think it's possible for me to be repaired. If I am repaired, I think there are certain parts of my spirit that have been irrevocably broken that those pieces aren't even manufactured anymore. <laughs> that's how broken I, like, that's broken. But the first thing I want to do is date. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I came in here missing my front tooth. Don't tell me I'm cute. We are hooking up, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's that new look. And so uh, I remember I got sober, right? 96 pounds. We're not 96 today. I was going to wear the dress I had on at the bank, but I'm like, you have to suck it in. It's just a, this ain't a see-through. But they can see it from the side, but you guys can't see it. So, uh, you know, and uh, so it's 96 pounds. I would drink. Enhanced my drinking with a few things that kept me up for eight, nine days at a time. And uh, I was very hyper-focused, if you will. <laughs> I got sober and I was missing my front tooth. Here's, here's what happened. I'm going to keep it super short. I shared an opinion. It wasn't supported. That's what happened. <laughs> I never stopped talking. No one puts baby in a corner, right? <laughs> and then I get sober and I'm bald-headed. And so this cut is intentional. Right, I went to a salon and had it done, and I went to a barber and had it shaped up before I left. But when I got sober, it was a manifestation of a lot of stuff that was going on. And so here's what would go on. I would get drunk. There were things living in my hair, and they would, like, be activated when I got drunk. Now, if you're going to be in my hair, be in my hair, but don't get all crazy. And so I remember talking to my best friend, and by best friend I meant we had just met, but I felt really bonded with her. And so... And so she's drunk, I'm drunk, and I tell her, because you got to share it with someone, there's something in my hair. And I remember she leaned back, right? That's not really a best friend move, but she leaned back. She had to process, and she asked me, how do you know? And I said, duh, while we were talking, they ran from this side to that side. <laughs> so then she did what best friends do. She got serious, right? And so in her her drunken infinite wisdom, she leaned in. You know it's serious when they lean in. And she said, you know, rubbing alcohol will sterilize anything. Well, there it is. It has always been a program of action. It may be in a program of hideous, wretched action, but it was a program of action. So I get a bottle of rubbing alcohol because my best friend just told me the solution. And so before I took any action, I set them down. You can't just rush into it, right? Now, here's the beauty. The beauty is I wasn't even sober. I wasn't even thinking about it, but I'm already practicing the traditions. That's tradition, too. It's a group conscience. I took a group conscience, right? I set them all down, and I said, look, I know you're up there. You can stay. I'm going to sterilize you. And so I remember I would pour rubbing alcohol all over my hair. And in the beginning, it was so soothing. Oh, my God. It was like a meditation. It was like I was walking along the beach. And then after a while, they began to become unruly, right? They got aggressive. So I had to get aggressive. And I remember I took a pair of scissors. I cut off all of my hair. But new friends, half measures avail us what? Nothing. So I took a shaver and I shaved it to the scalp because you know what the watchword here is? Thoroughness. I need it to be thorough. So I shaved all my hair off to the scalp. I know what you're thinking. You're like, ooh, ooh, bald-headed and toothless. Ooh, that's sexy. I know you're thinking it. I know you're thinking it. Come on. And so uh, I would wear T-shirts on my head as if they were fashionable turbans making my own statement. And uh, it was quite the vision, I can assure you. And so... The thing about it is this, 28 years old, I was 28 when I got sober, I'm 54 now. 
and I looked way older then than I do now. I was so exhausted, I was so devastated. Spiritual deterioration is what we are talking about, right? But what I'm describing to you are optics. Those are just optics. There are people who come into Alcoholics Anonymous and they come, they still have a job, they still have a home, they're paying a mortgage, they have a really cute car, right? They have a bank account and they are equally as broken as I was. I never get caught up with the optics. We are easily fooled when we keep looking. Oh, they look cute, but they're broken. We need to give people time to heal here. I remember they said, don't date in your first year. Well, why would I not date my first year? <laughs> of course I'm dating in my first year, duh. And so, because uh, so-and-so just told me that I was cute. I have to date in my first year. And so I remember being in a, being in a, a rehab, and uh, had I had my first job? Yeah, no. And <laughs> my first job was dating. Anyway, so I remember I was dating this guy, Mike, and then I was dating this other guy, Mike, because it just reduces confusion. And so... <laughs> We keep it real simple, you know. And so, so Mike's were really supportive. And uh, I would <laughs> I'd talk to my sponsor, and she would say, she would ask me, what'd you do today? I said, I went shopping. Now, she knows I don't have a job, right? So she's like, oh, you went shopping? I'm like, yeah, Mike came by and gave me a few hundred dollars. She's like, oh, which Mike? She knows. She knows there's two. And I said, oh, Italian Mike. And she goes, oh, didn't the other Mike come by yesterday and give you money. I said, yes, but it's okay because I don't ask them for anything. And so she said, oh, I guess that's okay. She paused. That's never a good sign. <laughs> she said, I guess that's okay if you're a prostitute. <laughs> I was livid. I, I could have come through the phone. I remember holding that phone and I'm not a, I'm what? You know what I mean? And so what she said, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that she loved me enough. She loved me enough to risk hurting my feelings to save my life. She said, Candace, prostitution is not just the, the physical act. It is being in a relationship for gain of any kind when the feelings are not reciprocal. And she said, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. That meant drunk. I didn't want to get drunk. I told you how I looked when I came in here. I came into a rehab. It was an indigent rehab. It wasn't a fancy tennis course and, you know, riding horses. It was make your own food if you want to eat. And so my sponsor is telling me, and that day, I got rid of both mics. Because my, and I got a job. <laughs> I thought I really did. You know what I mean? So, and I remember getting my first job. Like, I remember all of it. It was just, it was like huge deals. People say things like, there are no big deals. And they, it, it's all a big deal. It's a big deal. Being sober right now in this moment is a big deal. I didn't get sober for all this. I have an amazing life in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have an amazing life because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Right? And so it doesn't, how do we even get there? How do we get to me being 28 years old just because I have a relationship with beverage alcohol that I come to you feeling broken, feeling hopeless? That's not the relationship I signed up for. Alcohol in itself is not the problem. If this is alcohol, and I sit it here, it's not the problem. It is my attachment to it. It is my dependency on it. It is what I expect it to do for me. That's the problem. I have an abnormal relationship with alcohol. I can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And so the whole quest of sobriety is me being able to move into a space and shift that power. Right? I have to shift the reliance. And so when I take people who have time through the steps, I take them through the steps, and we're not talking about their drinking because they haven't drank in a number of years. If you come to me and you ask me to sponsor you, one, we're going to discuss it, see if it's a fit. Right? So when we sit down and we start going through the book, if you're 17 years sober, what you cannot do is keep telling me what you used to do 17 years ago. 
Because when people go out and they have time, it's not because of what they used to do. It's because of what they are doing right now, conduct unbecoming, unprincipled conduct right now. Alcoholism lives in arrogance, right? It lives in it's not your business. That Another word for that is secrets. So I have to have a sponsor, a sponsor who has a working knowledge of all 12 steps that I can get gut level honest with. I go to meetings where they say butt naked honest, where I can spiritually disrobe because my life is on the line. You know, I remember I was little and my grandmother raised me and she loved me and I loved her. She was everything to me. She was every, I loved her obsessively. She was my safe space. And at night, I was terrified of the dark, so I slept next to her. You ever had someone that you love so much, you just, wherever they are, if you're there, it's okay? She was that person for me. And so I remember my grandmother loved me, but she parented in a way that was super sketchy, right? So she would say things like, she would say things like, if you're going to lay down, get paid for it. (laughs) I was... I was nine years old. You know what I mean? <laughs> you don't even know what that means. But let me, let's go deeper with it. Because tonight, I'm going to tell you what I do. I do, I do uh, workshops, right? In my professional life, I do non-recovery workshops. In NAA, I do workshops. So we did a fear workshop, but we didn't even go as deep as I really go. So let's talk about that. This is my grandmother. She is my safe space. She is the person, the only person on the planet that I trust a million percent. And she is telling me, a child, that if I'm going to lay down, I need to get paid for it. Because I love her, I don't question that. Because I love her, because I consider her to be a safe person, I don't know that I need to question that. And that's the problem. Unexamined information, right? Information that is passed down, passed down through our biological family or passed down in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that have nothing to do with our text. And then there's my mom. My mother has me at 17 years old. She's a child. She was 16 when she was pregnant. She's not emotionally, mentally equipped to parent a child in a healthy way. She doesn't have the proper support system in place. My mother is hardcore violent. Her mother is hardcore violent. Right? And so my mom is a self-identified alcoholic. She's a self-admitted alcoholic. And my mother is young, so she's a budding alcoholic. It's wild. Her and my dad are wild, right? He's violent. He's a pimp. I'm sorry, manager. (laughs) So that's going on, right? And my mom has really big boobs. And I'm not telling you that to give you her stats. I'm saying that because she had uh, a fascination with packing her pistol in her bosom. So if you share something that she found particularly disagreeable, that gun would pop out, right? So she might shoot you, shoot at you, whatever, depending on what the mood was. And so the messaging that I'm receiving as a child, because again, I'm not thinking about it, but I'm definitely being given information that I am embracing and it's becoming a part of who I am. So what my mom teaches me through her aggression is if I want something done, I need to be forceful. I need to come at you from a a place of power, a place of dominance. And what my grandmother is teaching me that I am a commodity, that I need to look good and have someone else pick up my tab. I don't even think about this, right? And so I remember when I start drinking, I'm in junior high. My friends are drinking and having a good time. I want to have a good time, too. It's super simple in the beginning. But the thing is, what happens for me when I take a drink of alcohol is I cease to care about you. No, I can't lie to you. I feel too close to you. I don't care about you before I take a drink of alcohol. But once I get drunk, I'm inclined to share with you that I don't care about you, right? So I'm going to ask you to resist the urge of pulling me to the side and telling me how I have wronged you, allegedly, right? The big book talks about me. I love the big book. People who say things like, if you want to go to sleep, read the big book, clearly don't have a program because that book is a bestseller. That book is a page turner. That book is like a reality show in print, right? I mean, Bill's story alone, I love Bill. Bill is like my white twin. (laughs) He's my spirit animal, right? I read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I read Bill's story, and Bill just, he just sucks you in off the back. 
right? And so you start walking with him, going through the highs and the lows and all that is Bill. And he says, for three or four months, the goose hung high. You get excited. You're like, go, Bill, go. (laughs) And then he says, but that frightful day came when I drank once more. You're like, no, Bill, no. (laughs) Bill is a hustler, honey. (laughs) And he tends to rationalize, right? He's a cheater, but he's not going to say that. He's like, you know, for... uh, Times of drunkenness and extreme drunkenness helped me with infidelity. But Bill, stop it. (laughs) Stop it, Bill. You know what I mean? I'm going to need another inventory from you, Bill. (laughs) So I start drinking and doing my thing, and it's everything. I used to um, have this, this Sunday big book study. We called it a page at a time, right? And so we would go through a page. We'll probably just go through like one page the whole meeting. And it was excellent. And it was a discussion. You could share and then share back. And it was just like amazing. And so this guy described the first time he took a drink. He said, the first time I took a drink, I felt like I had met God. That is the deepest thing I had ever heard in my life. And when I heard it, it resounded in my gut, in my womb where I lived. And I said, that's it right there. Because if I take a drink and I feel like I have met God and you want me to leave God, that's a wrap. I'm going to go for broke to keep that relationship. I'm going to defy reality to stay in this relationship, right? And so I remember I'm drinking, and the big book says that I step on the toes of my fellows, and they retaliate seemingly without provocation. I am a toe masher from way back. <laughs> from way, But I'm not calling it stepping on your toes. What I'm calling it is I remember asking you to move, You are a little slow. I was assisting you, right? So what I call guiding you to the left, you call shoving. It's all a matter of perception. So I'm drinking and doing my thing, and I remember I was was living with my godmother. And at that point in my life, I'm a teenager. I'm in and out of foster homes. I'm on the streets of Hollywood as a runaway. And, you know, bad things happen to young girls. I'm protected on the streets of Hollywood. Right, and so now I'm with my godmother, and she's super accomplished and and uh, really successful in all areas. And so I go to live with her, you know. But I'm an alcoholic. I'm 14, 15, 16 years old. I'm drinking. I'm just my behavior's erratic. She wasn't prepared for someone like me, and I come from just like a hardcore background. She does not <laughs> at all like speak the language that I was coming with. And so what happens is. She had a Mercedes. She had bought this car. So I think I'm 16 at this point. And she had had her car for about six months. And she was leaving to attend the Black Caucus Conference in Washington. So she did what any adult would do with their vehicle. She parked her car in her driveway, took her keys, placed them in the candy dish in her home. The only thing missing from that equation is me. And as luck would have it, I was going to this club later on that night called the Whiskey. And so what better way to go to a club than in a brand new Mercedes? I mean, seriously. And so now here's the thing. And this is where it gets really foggy. (laughs) So when she left to go take the shuttle to the airport, (sighs) let me recall with sufficient force, (sighs) she said something like, and I can't be sure, (laughs) something like, don't touch my car. I don't know. I don't know if that's what she really said, but I know that if she said it, she didn't really mean it. And so the thing about who I am and how I live when I'm under the lash of alcoholism is I operate from a sliding scale, okay? What I say is law, so get clear because I want us to be friends. What you say, hmm, I think we have wiggle room, right? And so that day I take the car and I'm driving the car consumed with self because I'm in preparation for my debut later. And uh, as I'm driving the car, I run into someone else's car. (laughs) Whoops. So my hat's off to the person because I stood at the turning point that has a valid driver's license and and insurance because I don't, right? Now, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic for people to understand personal space because I've been a personal bubble person from way back. I never understand when people are talking to you right here. I'm like, are you needy? Did you not get something as a child? Move, right? And so in a loving, nurturing way. Anyway, so I hit this guy's car, and he is not a respecter of the personal bubble. 
He is right here. I need him to be here. He is right here. And I don't mind telling you, his energy, so aggressive. <laughs> so aggressive. I mean, he was bringing down my chi. You know what I mean? I need to be in a proper mind frame for the club. And so, and I remember he was speaking very aggressively and little spittles were coming and it was just like a lot. And I was ducking because he was like here and I need him to be here. And and he was so unreasonable. He wanted things like paperwork. I don't know. And so I just thought, you know what? I don't really like your attitude. And I got to go because I got to get ready for the club. So that's what I do. I leave. And that's who I am. There's no integrity. I don't live in column four. What is column four? Right? I always live in one and two, who you are, what you did, who you are, what you did. And if you wouldn't have, then I wouldn't have. You know what that equates to? Bondage. So I get in the car, the whole front end is like a permanent grin. I drive it back. I put the keys back in the candy dish. Clearly I can't make my debut in this heap. <laughs> so I go upstairs, I tell my friend, we're gonna take a cab, right? Cause the show must go on. I made a commitment. You know how we are about commitment. And uh, when my godmother returned, she is not okay with the car situation at all, right? She is peeved. She has seen this movie, Tough Love. I've never seen this movie. I'm 26 years sober. I don't ever want to see this movie. But the effect it had when she saw it inspired her to drop a contract of things I was expected to do for wrecking her car. So she comes to me and she says, I've drawn up, I've drawn up a contract of things you're going to do for ruining my car, right? She wanted me to give of myself and volunteer my time to some charitable organization. I thought, oh, what an order. I can't go through with it. And, uh, <laughs> and it may have only been one thing that she was asking, but when I'm in self, one is too much. It's too much. And, uh, you know, she was unwilling to just turn it over. She just, the environment was hostile. And so I remember I started to get pissed off. You know how we are, we step on the toes and then you, you say one thing and I'm like, how dare you, you know? And so I felt that she should have gotten over it by now. Um, I felt, and I don't mind sharing it with you, uh, I felt that she had a job, uh, had insurance, okay? And, oh, something just happened. Our friends left on Zoom. They were like, I don't like you, click. <laughs> Something's gone. It's literally a blank thing on Zoom, I just want you to know. So, uh, uh-oh. Someone's on the move. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> this is Pat, everyone. Yep. Oh, the battery. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have to move on. You're gonna have to recount it for them. So pay close attention. So, uh, <clears throat> so I remember thinking, you have insurance. Why are you coming down on me? Right? So again, when I'm living in untreated alcoholism, there is no where, are, where was I to blame? Looking at my mistakes, where was I selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and frightened? I never get to that part. I simply expect you to overlook any and everything I do. The thing about alcoholism is we live in the intention and other people live in the results. They live in the behavior. And so she was unwilling to turn this over. The environment was hostile. She was not fond of me and she was not making any pretense as if she were. And so I moved out because I had other toes to step on. And I remember I end up getting a job at this record label and I'm young. I am young, I have low self-esteem, but I don't know I have low self-esteem because I don't travel in circles where we examine things like that, right? I come from a place of look good, get more, and be fabulous at all times. And I'm so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous because I can tell you prior to coming to you, I would have been one of those insipid individuals that talked about absolutely nothing except what I'm wearing at all times. When I got sober, I stood for nothing. I knew how to lay down, but I did not stand for anything. You know how I learned to stand is steps one through 12. And so when they hired me at this label, they hired me as a receptionist, but <laughs> that was a mere technicality. I knew they really meant CEO. Do you know what I mean? And so 
And so here's what's real deep about it. I literally felt unworthy and entitled at the very same time. And so I would walk around assuming the posture, waiting for them to tap me and say, you you only had two jobs, but run this entire label, right? And so what ends up happening is I get promoted. I get promoted. Now I work in promotions. I'm promoting multi-platinum artists. And this is before social media, so it was a super exclusive world when you were in the record industry. And I needed that because I felt super basic. And so this gave me some type of credibility. I lived externally. My identity was the label I worked for, where I lived, and who I knew. My friendships were not based on shared goals and common ambition. They were based on, you're cute, I'm cute, let's hang out, that's it and talk about stuff. And so what happened for me is every day I felt like a little kid playing dress up. And I remember learning that my grandmother died. My grandmother was everything to me. Yet I didn't learn that she had died until she had already been buried. And that's because I was so busy being all I could be, living in illusions, delusions, and facades. I didn't want to stop and go back to anything that was unpleasant. I don't want to remember where I really came from because I'm lying about everything about my life. And so I find out that she's already gone. She's already buried. And I remember I start looking around at my stuff, and my stuff is no longer enough. What do you do when you get to that space? I don't have any tools. I don't know how to process. I don't have an inventory. I drink. That's what I do. And I drink more. My stuff had always been enough, and now it's not. And then I remember the voices started getting louder. And the voices told me that I'm working and living in a world built on make-believe. The voices told me to get real. I don't know how to get real. I just know how to get drunk. And so I remember walking in, and I don't know what the time frame was of me walking away from that entire life from the moment I found out my grandmother had been, I don't know if it was a week or if it was a month, I can't recall because I was really always drunk. But I do know that I walked in and I resigned so I could get real. And I remember running out of money and then running out of your money, which was a bummer. And now I have to make a decision because I am not a periodic, I drink period. And so I remember making the decision to market myself in exchange for a drink. I refer to this as the public relations phase of my development. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so I step out there, and uh, they wanted what I had, and my stocks were at an all-time high. You know what old men love? Young girls. I was never short of clients. And so I'm on the streets, and I told you I'm up for days, and I'm reckless, and I start off in high-end areas, and I end up down in skid row because people are so uppity. You miss one tooth, (laughs) and all of a sudden, they don't want to pay full price. Who made that rule up? (laughs) So I relocate down to skid row where they don't expect a gal to have all her teeth, and... uh, And so now I'm doing a lot more for a lot less. A lot more. I want to talk to you about how my tooth got knocked out. So at this point, you know, I just, it's just, it's over, but we still have a couple of more years to go. It's like that type of living, that type of drinking, right? And so I'm down in Skid Row, and I meet this girl, big girl, right? And she was really sexy and confident, and I'm like, tiny and confident, and so we start talking about big dreams, and she's like, we should partner together, and we should go work at the Bunny Ranch in Nevada, and I was like, yeah, let's go to the Bunny Ranch. I am like 91 pounds, you know what I mean? I'm going, no one's going to a Bunny Ranch, and so, but you got to keep hope alive, right? And so, so I'm like, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, yeah, I couldn't leave a three-block radius, and, uh, She said, you know, my boyfriend just got out of jail and he hits me sometimes. Now, I come from a super violent background and I was really violent. So if there's hitting to be done, I'm hitting you. (laughs) It's not the other way around. So when she says that to me, I was like, well, get rid of him, right? I even know what we're talking about. Let's move on. And so so we meet a client. I'll call him John. And uh, (laughs) so we negotiate some terms and conditions and... uh, 
And we go to this sleazy, slimy motel, and we take care of business, and John leaves. And so she and I are there, and we're drinking and getting loaded, and we hear a knock at the door. And I'm like, who is that? She goes, that's probably my boyfriend. I'm like, how would he know? Because we got in the car with this guy that I had never met. We drove for like 10 minutes. This guy doesn't have a car, so how would he? But now that I look back, they probably did this all the time. Like, I just, duh. So... Knock at the door, open it, it's the guy, so he comes in, so now it's all of us, and they start arguing, and he starts hitting her. She is crouched over in the corner between this bed in this nasty, seedy motel, and he is hitting her. He is trying to hit her in her skull, and so I am telling him to stop. Stop hitting her. Knock it off. And then I just take a stand. You better knock it off. And he did. He walked over. He hit me one time. And my tooth flew across the room. And then he walked back and continued hitting her. And I remember, because we talk about moments of clarity. A moment of clarity is when I step outside of myself and I see myself exactly as I am. No filters. And I remember, up until that moment, I had been telling myself, if I ever want to go back into the label, I could. This is all temporary. I could go back into that life any time I want to. But that night in that motel, when my tooth got knocked out, I have always had beautiful full lips. That night, they covered my whole face. And I remember my mouth was bleeding. And I stood in the grimy mirror. And I remember thinking, I'm going to have to stay down here. There's no way I can just walk into someone else's company. So I must stay drunk. It's not the bottle that's the problem. It is my dependency on it. It is what I'm expecting it to do for me. It has to change the way I feel. That is why I pick it up. That is the promise of that relationship. And I'm not willing to let it go because I have to stand and rebuild from that moment. It's too much. And so after he got done beating her, he was so apologetic. He came over and he was like, I am so sorry. Let, he goes, we're going to find your tooth and they can put it back in. And I remember a little ray of hope. I was like, really? <laughs> he was like, yep. I was like, okay. So now all three of us are getting loaded and looking for my tooth. <laughs> they didn't find it. This is courtesy of a really good dentist. And so, uh, and so that was like, that was how it was, I was living, right? I remember, you know, when I got sober, I, uh, I remember falling in love in sobriety, and I want to talk about it because I was talking about it a little bit in the fear inventory workshop, but I really want to, I want to walk you through what happened because it changed who I am as a sober woman. When I was six years sober, I fell in love. I'd been in many, many relationships, right? And uh, many, many relationships. And so in these relationships, someone is always saying, I love you, and because I'm a team player, I always say, I love you too, right? But I'm completely lying at all times. And so now, however, I really mean it. And so I'm in love, but it doesn't look like I thought love should look. It was verbally and physically abusive. I participated equally in both. Actually, I started the physical violence, and I used to not say that, but I did, right? Because where I come from, if I tell you to shut up and you don't, then I'm going to help you. And so now this is in my recovery. I don't bring this this behavior into my relationships, but I had never been in love before. And so that saying, I hit you because I love you, was true. That's how deep it is. Unexamined beliefs. And so what happens when you start living like I'm living and you're active in Alcoholics Anonymous is there are a lot of secrets that have to go with this behavior. I sponsor women right? We have a sober, active family. We talk about being ladies in recovery. I'm jumping on planes. I'm talking all over the globe and Alcoholics Anonymous about living a new way of life. But I'm jumping on planes with long sleeves in the summer because I've got bruises. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not leaving this relationship because I'm committed. And I remember six, seven, eight and a half years sober, that relationship was a drink for me. I have to be able right now in this moment to identify what is alcohol right now. 
We talk about whiskey in our milk. What is the whiskey in my milk? What is the behavior that I'm not willing to let go of, that I keep defending, that I that you can't get away from me? That every time you bring it up, I have to make it your problem. Whatever that behavior is, that's the drink. And it'll take me out. And so I'm in this relationship, and I am deeply in love. And I mean deeply in love. And so the thing about it is I hadn't examined The value system. This wasn't a relationship where we talked about what we have in common. We met, I was at a convention. I wasn't talking at the convention where I was at a convention with my friends. We went to a club and we met and then we slept together and that was that. Now we're in a relationship, right? It was like that type of thing. And so you're always trying to make it work from the back end. And I remember my sponsor, Gloria Decker, she's now passed on. And Gloria was the love of my life. She was the epitome of what a sober woman was. She loved Alcoholics Anonymous. She loved our our program. Our program is the book. Meetings are not the program. They are where we come to share our interpretation of what's in the program, which is the book. And so Gloria loved the text Alcoholics Anonymous. She was strong in it, and she made sure I stayed in it and lived from it as best possible. But we have to go through what we have to go through to move into the next space of our development. And so she would say, Candace, you have to leave this relationship. Candace, you are, you are living drunk but talking sober. And I would tell her, I can't leave. This is my soulmate. Six, seven, eight years sober, standing in the, the sunlight of the spirit and choosing to live in a closet because I was unwilling to surrender what I thought was love. And the, the reality is, I didn't think I was ever going to be loved like this again, and I wasn't willing to let it go. I pray I'm not loved like that again. And so I remember she became insistent that I leave this relationship, and you know what I thought? (laughs) I thought she was jealous. (laughs) I thought she didn't understand our passion, right? (laughs) And so I stopped talking to her about it. I start going straight to the source. You got to skip the middleman when they're tripping. And so I start praying, spirit, spirit, give me a sign. Should I stay in this relationship? The police came. Ooh, not that sign. (laughs) So what do you do now that the relationship is over? It's in the toilet. I did what anyone here would do. We got engaged. (laughs) But we were engaged for six days, but they were long days, like in dog years. And I remember when I left that relationship, I had been throwing up for the last three months every day because my spirit could not process how I was living. I am in direct conflict with the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I remember when I took that ring off my finger, I wanted to drink and I wanted to die. The obsession to drink came back because of my conduct. It's not how I was talking, it's how I was living that was making me thirsty. And I remember thinking, I'm never going to love again. I was angry at my sponsor because she was right. I needed her to be wrong. I was angry at my higher power because my third step was more of a bulleted list of demands that I figuratively slid over and then threw in some words like, your will not mind be done, but I didn't mean it. And so I remember being devastated. I was so hurt that it hurt to breathe That is how devastated I was, having to leave the love of my life. I'm never going to love again. Why would you do this to me? Anyway, six days later, I'm in another relationship. And so (laughs) you got to let the healing begin, right? And so uh, we don't want to live in morbid reflection. And so I get into this relationship, small detail. I know there's no judgment in the rooms, right? So... Six days later, I'm in another relationship with someone who's in a relationship. (laughs) I totally felt judgment like right there. Anyway, so so I get into this relationship and people are talking about me. I'm getting calls from people who don't even go to my meetings because they're hearing things, right? Candace, I'm hearing you're not okay. What's going on? I'm out of control. My sponsor's dying. She had a rare lung disease. She was... In, in and out of the hospital, more in than out. You know, my old sponsor, Clancy, who I was with for a long time after Gloria, he would say, no friendly direction. There was no friendly direction. I didn't trust anyone in my life. I didn't trust myself. I for sure didn't trust my cheating partner, who I just ripped from another relationship. And I remember having a discussion, like, you need to get out of that relationship. You're making me look bad. I'm in AA. 
<laughs> Ego is deadly. It takes so many people out, doesn't it? But here's the deal. The whole time, I remember losing all the people I sponsored because they no longer felt safe with me. I started saying, I want to drink, right? But the whole time, I'm still showing up. I'm showing up, and I am so grateful for trained feet. They kept telling me, shut your mouth and train your feet, shut your mouth. And so I haven't always shown up and been impeccable in my behavior, but I have always shown up consistently. I don't leave. And I remember I had a greeting commitment, and I would stand at the door and sob. (laughs) 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 If you want what we have, you know. (laughs) And it was the best I could do. You have to see me like that. You can't just see me when I pull it together tonight. I fly into Puerto Vallarta, and I'm going to fly out and go to my bank fabulous life. You have to see me when I've made decisions based on self, based on lack, based on limitation, based on the feeling of unworthiness. You need to see me when I walk through that. You need to see how I walk through it so that you know when your turn comes and everyone gets a turn. You need to know that you can go through it sober. Sober. Yours may not be a relationship. It may be loss of money. It may be the death of a loved one. I lost my stepmom four years ago, and it devastated my entire world. It changed my life. I left my home group. I had been a member of the big group for a very long time. That meant I had to leave my sponsor. I let go of all the women I sponsored. I could not pray. I was so devastated. I was so angry. When I lost my stepmom, she had been with me through everything. You know, I'm just not okay with it. That's just the reality of it. And I'm walking through it, but I am not okay with it, period. That's it. That's all. But I'm staying here because I love it here, and I know that she would be disappointed if I left. But when I lost her, it changed my life. When I tell you I couldn't pray, I couldn't pray. I was talking to her. I said, give me a sign that you made it to the other side okay. This is four years ago. And then I thought maybe I broke protocol. So I said, God, let me know. I don't want to go up, you know, ahead of you. Let me know that she's okay. <laughs> you don't want people to be afraid to meet you. You know what I mean? And I didn't think I put a time limit on it. But after two weeks, when I didn't get a sign, that was it. We were done. That's a wrap. I'm not praying to you for what? Huh. And so walking through that, right, Left the home group. Sponsor says, I won't sponsor if you don't go to this home group. Well, then you're gone, right? So then I call a friend. Hey, can you, can I check in with you until I find someone local? But I sponsor people out of state, out of country. So I ended up asking this woman who I'd known for forever. We traveled together for forever. If she would officially sponsor me, she goes, oh, Candice, I already considered myself. I said, okay, I just want to be official, Right. But she knew I didn't believe in God because when I don't believe, I'm loud about it. (laughs) And if you believe and I don't believe, then I harass you. (laughs) I'm like, you're a sheep. It's propaganda, you know. (laughs) Wait, just two days ago, God was everything. You know what I mean? And so this is why we have to be grounded in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is why if I'm your sponsor, I can't be your God. Because the highest I ever get is human. You have to be grounded. You have to have a relationship with your own God. I was struggling. I was devastated. I felt lost. I wasn't connected to anyone on this planet. My stepmom was the glue to me being connected to everybody. I didn't. Ah. So after I asked her to sponsor me, she sends me an email. She said in her meditation, God told her to ask me if I believed in God. So... I'm reading the I mean I'm reading the email and I'm thinking, no, we already talked about it. So I type back, no. <laughs> then she types back. So God told her that if I didn't believe in him, that she couldn't sponsor me. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so I don't want to email because I'm thinking, what? So I get home, I call, she's out of the country, I call, I said, I don't understand. You know that I am devastated right now. She was the knot in my rope. 
you understand? When you were just hanging on by a thread, she was that knot, and she just snipped it. I am so grateful. I was 21 years sober. I'm so grateful that that happened when I was at that length of time, and I had, I've lost my faith before, and it always feels like I'm never going to get it back, and I always do. I always have to go deeper. I always have to go deeper. I always have to go deeper. I always feel like I can't do it this time, but I always do. And so when she did that, it pissed me off more than I was already pissed off with God. And I said, you know why it's so difficult to find a sponsor at my length? Because so many people sponsor from ego and not the book. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it does not tell me that I have to get here ready. It says I come to believe. So if the purpose of all 12 steps is for me to build a relationship with a power greater than myself, why would your response not be, Candace, let's take all 12 steps and see if you're able to rebuild your relationship? And I said, so you're right. You can't sponsor me. And so I asked a friend who I had known my whole life in sobriety if I could work with her. I said, I got to have a sponsor. And she said yes, and I was with her for a year. She was a good person. She wasn't as strong as I was in the work, so I, I, I moved on. And lovely woman blew her brains out at 36 years sober. Do you understand what I mean? You can't ever be my higher power. That is not what we're doing here. We get to be examples of humanness, of spirit manifest. Let me tell you how I came to believe um, one more time in a power greater than myself. I call it spirit, the power of healing, love, and light. So when I was on those streets, a lot of things happened, right? A lot of things that would just not be appropriate for me to share here. But rest assured that I have a sponsor who knows all of it. And so I happened to, so I started praying to AA. And I've done that before when I lose my faith. I just pray to AA. AA is a power greater than myself. AA has never failed me. In 26 years, AA has never failed failed me ever, not once. And so I remembered this night I was, uh, I was working and, uh, I met a potential client and he was pushing a basket. Now I don't want to sound judgy, but he said, well, let's go to my apartment. And I remember thinking how odd that you would have an apartment and a basket. But anyway, I said, (laughs) I said, Okay, you know, keep an open mind. Okay, keep an open mind. So we're walking, like, for, like, ever, right, to get to this apartment. So we go in the apartment. (laughs) There's nothing there that suggests he lives here. There's only women's things. That should have been a red flag. But when I'm in desperation, a red flag becomes a red carpet of invitation. To insanity, And so we're there all night and uh, we're getting loaded. But what we don't do is fulfill the terms and conditions of what I was there for. And that's not my problem because there's a clause. If you don't get it done in 30 minutes, I don't know what to tell you. So now <laughs> it's hours later. <laughs> we're talking business. So anyway, it's hours later. <laughs> I hear women come in. Oh, and I used to and I have so much shame. I had shame maybe because I didn't ask enough, but not for the shame that you would think I have. So anyway... <laughs> I, uh, so I say, I have to go. He's out of money. I'm out of time. I got to go. I don't want you to go. I have to leave. You can't leave. I said, well, that's kidnapping. Now, apparently that was a trigger. Those words. He said, kidnapping, that's 25 years to life. I'd rather kill you. And he took me by my neck and threw me from here to there. And I rem- it was a carpet, and so what I hadn't realized, because it was all happening so quickly, is that I had skidded on this carpet to a place where it took my skin off and my bone was popping out. But I didn't see that until after this little uh, melee was over, right? So he's choking me. They say it takes four and a half minutes to strangle someone. You're not counting. I don't know if that's true. I just remember that I started losing consciousness the first time, and then I came Two, then I started losing consciousness the second time. He's on me. This guy, I'm like 5'6", without heels, right? He's probably 6'2", and uh, he's choking me. And the third time that I was losing consciousness, I remember stepping out of myself and observing. And I said, so this is how it's going to end, in a strange place with a strange man doing strange things. And I wasn't even sad. It was just a moment of acceptance. 
And as I started to lose consciousness that third time, I knew it was going to be the last time. In the blink of an eye, this man, and I'm telling you it's serious because there's a scar right, because you go, did you make it up? Nope, there's a scar right here. This man who was intent upon killing me was standing across the room. How did that happen? The power that plucked this guy off of me like a feather is the power that I pray to right to the second. It was that memory that came back and allowed me to begin praying again because I'm like, there has to be a purpose for me. And when I remember that incident, I remember all the others that it happened times that I should have been dead, but my life was spared. I cannot doubt the power that exists, the power of light, the power of healing, the power of love. And so in this moment, I am grounded in a power greater than myself, right? And so I always like to finish, and I'm like, I don't want you to think I'm walking around not believing. I do believe, absolutely. And so uh, anyway, I was in that relationship, and um, I asked this person to drink with me one night. I was devastated. I was in pain. I don't want to be here. I want to drink. And they said they would drink with me. I said, if I drink, will you leave? They said, no. I asked, if I drink, will you drink with me? They said, yes. It's deep. When you make another person your God, if that person is not grounded in the power greater than themselves, you could be screwed. This person was willing to forfeit their life to keep me in a relationship. I'm not faithful. You're not faithful. What are you talking about? And so the only reason my sobriety date has never changed, and I define sobriety as I don't take anything at any time that affects me from my neck up. I don't drink near beer because I'm not near sober. (laughs) There's not even a debate. Oh, it's not. Yes, it's not sober. You can't buy it if you're under 18 because it has alcohol in it. And it doesn't matter if it's .05. If it's not zero ad infinitum, I can't have it. I don't smoke weed whether a doctor tells me I can or not because it's not sober. When I got sober, I don't want to cut corners. I want to be sober. Through good times and through bad, I have all weather sobriety. And so I remember getting a hold of my sponsor and telling her what happened. She said, Candice, you don't have the right to jeopardize another person's sobriety. Stop quoting the book and start living by the principles which I thought was harsh, and so, and I felt judged. And so I remember saying, well, what do you want me to do? She's like, get away from him, leave him alone, you know. And so I ended that relationship. They drank, they're still drinking. I have made amends for that. Here's the reality. It's awful that I would do that to another alcoholic. It is. But when I'm in untreated alcoholism, it's really not about you. It's about what I need, and whatever I think that is, that's what I'm going to do. Period. And so... If I can't get you sober, I can't get you drunk. They did not drink because of me. They drank because their sobriety was not their priority. So uh, I had to learn how to date again. And I remember going back through the steps. And that is where I learned how to do the fear inventory appropriately. Resentment, fear, sex inventory. And the fear inventory changed my entire life. And that is why I do workshops all over the globe. Usually when I'm at a conference talking, I'll also do a workshop. Do you know what I mean? And so um, what happened when I was out there is I was on the streets, I was drinking, and I got pregnant. And I don't want to do anything to jeopardize the life of an unborn child. I am not that woman until I am. And I'm never going to do this again until I do it again. That is the illness of alcoholism. That is the progressive nature of what ails me. So I get pregnant, and I decide I can't have this baby. It does not mean I support termination or I don't support termination. I don't speak on what my view is because it's an outside issue. I will share this. When I was little, there were men who came in the home that I lived in with my grandmother, and those men were fond of me in a way that is deeply disturbing. And they were fond of me often. And so because of the type of alcoholic woman I had become, I couldn't guarantee that a child in my care would be safe. And it was for that reason that I made the decision that I could not have this baby. 
What's interesting is that it was never a debate as to whether or not I could continue drinking. That was like breathing. So I always have to drink, no matter what. When I made the decision to terminate the pregnancy, I learned via every news station, every radio station, every TV station, that a member of my family had been arrested for raping, murdering, and dismembering my little eight-year-old girl cousin. And the person who is responsible is my mom. And so when that happens, what do you do? I am the oldest of three. I was not raised with my mother, although I was made to go to her house all too often, but my brother and sister have endured things that no child should ever even know exists. So I certainly have opinions on child protective service, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. And so I remember there's a baby in my belly and I'm on the street. And my mother is a child murderer. She's a pedophile and a child murderer. My mother has killed two children ages two and eight. The same exact manner, that is her signature. She's killed a lot of adults, which I knew, but I wasn't okay with the whole kid thing. And so I remember in that moment thinking anything of beauty, anything of worth, anything of value is no longer afforded to someone like me. I remember thinking that once your destiny had been determined, nothing could ever be done to change it. And that is why I love Alcoholics Anonymous. That is why I stand for Alcoholics Anonymous. There are so many things that are going on in this program that jeopardize our future. And people are afraid to speak up because they may not be like, I don't care if you don't like me because I don't respect you if you're trying to kill AA. This is my life. When you're asked to read something, read it as written. Don't bring your opinion into it. I think that's crazy that we are so empowered that we change words because you don't like it. We didn't ask you what you think about it. Take the step so you can work through that. When I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I talk about recovery from alcoholism. This isn't everything anonymous. Why? Because the drunk only has one room. An addict can go a million places. But we have one. We have to protect it. The House of Alcoholics Anonymous has to be the House of Alcoholics Anonymous. Is there's a reason we're the parent program. Right? I'm a drunk. You heard my story tonight. There's no place for me to go. If I don't have this, where am I going to go? Do you know what they told me when I got sober? They told me I wasn't going to stay. Doctors diagnosed me with a lot of stuff. Right? They said you got to be medicated for the rest of your life. And I'm not going to speak about whether what that is for you. That's your own personal decision. But it wasn't the right decision for me. But you look at someone like me and you automatically just write me off. He gave me this whole diagnosis. I just wanted a tooth. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. Thought you were a dentist. Anyway. So what ends up happening is I go through this pregnancy. I'm still on the streets. I do all the stuff that you do on the streets and People are always trying to kill me or I'm trying to kill them. It was just a lot of chaos. And uh, I remember when I went into labor, I had been up for three days straight. I was in labor for 17 hours. I was, I was just frightened. I was by myself. My hair was matted. You know what I remember? I remember how nice the nurses were to me. I don't know if anyone here is a nurse, but if you are, I just want to thank you so much. I can only imagine how many women like me they've seen come in that hospital Yet they were so kind to me. And I remember when I gave birth to my daughter, she was so beautiful and I felt so ugly. I felt so ugly. And I was holding this little beautiful baby and this hadn't been the type of pregnancy where my partner and I decorated a room and we talked about names. I don't know who her dad is. I'm on the streets, but she's so beautiful. And in that moment I wanted peace and so I named my daughter Serenity. I didn't understand that the way I was living would prevent me from ever having the very life I said I wanted. And I didn't have any tools to stop living that way. So if you were new, we understand that you're getting in your own way. We're going to ask you to just do what we do. It's okay if you misstep. Everyone missteps. You know, my sponsor Clancy used to say, it's not making the mistake that takes us out, it's defending it. If something's brought to you, say, I didn't mean it. Okay, don't defend it. That just pisses everybody off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stop it. So I remember holding my daughter, 
and she was shaking in my arms, and I don't know why. And I asked the nurse, why is she shaking? She said she's detoxing. That type of shame, lipstick won't fix. Getting my tooth fixed won't fix. Getting a, a good job won't fix. I've had long hair won't fix. Getting a cute partner won't fix. You know what those things do? They magnify your brokenness. Because when you walk away from all that and you're in the stillness of your own space, you are sitting with you. I'm so grateful for the 12 steps, all 12. I don't live in 10, 11, and 12. I live in 1 through 12. I'm so grateful. I left that hospital. My daughter was three days old. I never saw her again. I tried to find her when I got sober. They told me she had already been adopted. They wouldn't give me any information. I remember crying, and I remember staying sober. And I remember, because I'd gone through all of the steps, that one year, Spirit said, celebrate her. I was always writing to her on her birthday, and I would just keep the letters. But I started celebrating my daughter on her birthday, and I did it by gifting other mothers and daughters. Every year, I would pray on how to celebrate her this year, and then I would do something for a mother and daughter. Whatever I wanted to do for my baby, I just did for you. You taught me that. Alcoholism says live in shame. AA says we don't have time for that. Live in your beauty. Step into your truth. How do I step into my truth? By going through an inventory, getting rid of all the falsehoods. I just kept hoping that when she found me, if she found me, she wouldn't be embarrassed. That's all I wanted. And I just remember thinking the day may never come. When my daughter turned 21, I sent a woman and her daughter to the spa all day because it's what I wanted to do. But I've done like everything. I threw a party at Chuck E. Cheese for her when she was seven, like all these things. And so last year, (laughs) my daughter found me. (laughs) She found me. And so I want to close with this. You know, I was on my way to a meeting uh, to speak, a meeting I speak at every year. There are certain meetings I talk at like every year, right? It's about 250 people. And uh, I had left my regular meeting on my way. It was at a red light. I was not driving a text. I was at a red light. And I said, oh, I have an email from Ancestry.com, which I registered with and 23andMe to find my daughter. So I see a message from Serenity. And I was like, oh. and I was like, no, 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 no. I know you, Ancestry with your eighth cousin and your ninth cousin. You know what I mean? So I open it, not thinking it's my daughter, right? And so the message said, it says we are related and you are my mom. And I remember not being able to drive my car. I was at a turn lane. I had to figure out how to turn, how to pull over. It was crazy. And when we talked that night, because I said, okay, you're not going to, the meeting's 50 miles away. You've got to drive. And I remember us talking, and I remember us meeting the next day and her saying, you're a grandmother. But I'm not a grandma. I'm the best grandmother that ever was. You are not even hearing me right now. It's a whole other deal. You do not know. They did not tell me what it was like to be a grandmother. Oh, my God. And my grandbaby is three. Stop it right now. Mm -mm. (laughs) And so my daughter and I are, are getting to know each other. We're building a relationship. I'm building a relationship with this, this young woman. And my granddaughter, my daughter told me three months after we met, we talk all the time, but she called me and she said, you know, I was thinking about you. I love that. And she said, I was thinking you should do something like a motivational calendar. My daughter knows that her grandmother is a child murderer. She knows that her grandfather is a retired pimp. She knows that her mother used to be on the streets doing everything under the sun, but she met me as a sober, active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She knows my sponsees because she came to a meeting with me just because I wanted her to see what we did. And because of that, she thinks I should do something like a motivational calendar. I used to live in alleys. And I was so touched, and I would share it at the end of my story, but I'm not going to do anything with it. A few months later, I'm in the shower, spirit. Uh Uh-oh. Spirit said, do a motivational calendar. I said out loud, I can't do that. I always say that. You know what you always say? Start here. And so I did. I published the Serenity 2021 calendar last year, and it sold out all over the world. Is that crazy? You know... It's a big deal, these things for me. It may not be a big deal for anyone else, but when I got here, it wasn't about that. 
and now it's an annual calendar. The Serenity 2022 calendar is selling out. It's went to New Zealand, it's been to Australia, right? You got the calendar? Yep. You bring it with you? Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because how is that possible? My daughter told my sponsee, she said, I was just looking to find my birth mother. I didn't know I was going to meet Superwoman. <laughs> so for that, I say thank you for my life. Thank you so much tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.